Satori Taramada, grandfather, grandmother of all things. He brought us a new day, a new beginning. We give thanks to our ancestors who gave us life. We give thanks to the four leggeds, the winged ones, to the sacred water, to the tree people who give us air. For all these things, we're grateful. We're going to offer a blessing to open our session today. The blessing to surround this room, the building that we're in, the town, the state, just spiraling around the world. This little seed of hope, a little seed of unity, spreading around the earth. Remember that we are the seeds of what is becoming. But when it seems dark and cold, we're in the earth dreaming, dreaming the spring, dreaming the apple blossoms, dreaming our grandchildren, our grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren. Oh, 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 oh. I'm Charlie Toledo, director of Suskal Intertribal Council based in Napa County. I've been the director since 1992. And with me today is Jojo. Oh, wait, Jojo's with us. <laughs> Jojo is with us. Hello, Jojo. And Jojo is? Jojo's my dog. He's our companion. He's our healer. He just insisted on being in this video. So here he is with us, helping us to promote Susco Council. He's one of the watchdogs. He's with us in ceremony and prayer and work days. He keeps track of everybody that's out there, makes sure everybody gets to where they're supposed to be. And then when it's time for everybody to leave, he walks them to their car. He's a good dog. He's a very good dog. And my name is Ree Casal. I am the secretary, standing secretary, current st secretary of the Susco board. And Ree's been with Suskel since for about 20 years when she was much, much younger. Years ago, we started this dream. Like we said, <laughs> much younger. <laughs> and Suskel Intertribal Council is about education of Native American people from this region, from Northern California. Napa Valley is one of the oldest inhabited places in North America, continuously inhabited. One of the oldest continuously inhabited places in North America. And so it's the place that we felt called and our elders were asking us when way back in the early 1980s when things were still very troubled in the California Indian world. Uh, we were thinking of as urban assimilated Indians how we could help the people isolated and cut off on the reservations and rancherias in Northern California. And the collective thought of many, many discussions over quite a few years was that the tribal people and urban Indians needed a place where they could gather for ceremony and to preserve of our oral traditions and uh, our lifestyle, you know, share the richness of a culture in contemporary terms, not in a museum, old dead things looking to the romantic past, but to the present uh, with the traditions and ceremonies of the Native American culture. One of the things, our arbor, we have a ceremonial arbor that was the first thing built out on our land base, Suskal House, that's what Suskal House is. It's a 23-acre land base up in the northeastern part of Napa County. And we the first thing we built after the land was paid for was the ceremonial harbor. And that harbor is dedicated to the unity of all life. Initially when we were designing it and dreaming it, we thought, oh, of all tribes. And we thought, well, we don't want to, you know, just 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 place anybody. So we thought unity of all people. But we were out there with the lizards and hummingbirds and owls and the coyotes. We started realizing, oh no, this is dedicated to the unity of all life. And we planted a circle of cedar trees around the arbor so that as the wood poles, the core cedar poles die away, the trees will become a circle for us where ceremony has been done in practice and dreamed. It was dreamed. Everything that is on the land now, somebody dreamed it. The arbor, the location of the arbor, Re was with us at that time. A lot of the people that went out when we were first looking for property and thinking about what it was going to be like, and we had formed as a 501c3. It was 1992 and 1998 we purchased the land. And so what we're going to look at is a, a visual of 1992 to the present time of Susquehanna. That's gonna, what we're going to show up. Okay, well, 
2020 has been a crazy, crazy year. Everyone admits that. And as we know, everyone's been having to pivot and do something a little bit different um, for their events and um, to fundraise. So here we are in the new era of virtual and online auctions. So this is our 24th annual art mm -hmm. auction and we've gone, we're going virtual. We're going to have a website that sits up and people will be able to go onto the website and bid. And the money that we raise for the art auction the last 23 years goes towards the construction of Suspel House out on the Suspel property. So I'm really excited about this because this is a new world and being able to take this art auction that has been limited to the people who have come to dinner and make it worldwide. We have people who are following us in Europe um, I'm really excited to see who's involved with this. Yeah, we can expand our our audience. We can expand our supporters and donors, and we're really excited about that. And the Art Auction is an event that we've done every year to build community, to come together with old friends and new friends, to watch the children grow. We've seen Ree's children, my children grow into adults. Our grandchildren are there. Um, and so this is great to just broaden our scope of who can participate. A lot of what Suskel does is virtual. Now, especially with 2020 and the pandemic, it's kind of jump-started us into this virtual age, or I call it telepathic or astral age, where we're coming into a place of one world and one mind. Again, that unity of all life. And so we're really excited about having this live website. We have incredible, beautiful Native American art that comes from around, I think most of it is from the United States, Native tribes, but there's a few pieces from Mexico and we're just really excited to share it with a broader audience. And this is our first opportunity. We've talked about it a lot, mm -hmm. but we didn't have the technology. And that's one of the silver linings of this pandemic is it's really pushed all of us collectively kind of, you know, for faster than we would have gone into a virtual world. I think our grandchildren, or some people's children, are there. They're, they're studying and learning and thinking in uh, virtual realities that older people like myself still struggle a little bit to do. But the pandemic has helped us to, the technology was there, it got way, you know, all the kinks knocked out of it. Everybody's getting used to coming together this way, and it's real, it's as real as anything. Absolutely. And talking about coming together, um, the Cisco Intertribal Council is not just one person. It is a collaboration of lots and lots of people. Um, I know there's been times that I've been talking about it and I'll say, and Charlie did, and she's always like, nope. Suskel Council did it. So I'd like to introduce you to a few of those people who have really stood behind us and made Suskel Intertribal what it is. And that is the 2020 board. Hey, hello. My name is Bruce Streblow and I am the president of the board of, on the board of Suskel Intertribal Council. And I am affiliated with the Cherokee tribe people. Um, I have been involved with Suskel I was trying to think back. I, it probably has been 20 years. I got involved with Soskel by uh, a friend of a friend who Charlie was reaching out to looking for some work to be done on the property. And so for some reason, unknown to me, why I volunteered and went up and assisted in trenching and helping to develop the water system so that we could uh, make the place run because without water, you don't have much of anything. And uh, so that was how I got involved. And by working on the property, it's a place that's very easy to sort of, I'll use the word, fall in love with, feel the spirit. And I was listening to, and talking with Charlie I immediately started to share her dream of what she wanted for the property and her goal of being a, a place where people can come, learn about their culture and keep that strong. And uh, I'm very happy to be a part of that. And we wanna get these 
buildings up and make it so that uh, that can happen. And I think that uh, that's pretty much how I'm uh, involved. So thank you very much. Kwe Kwe, my name is Tom King McMahon and I'm the vice chair for Susco. I descend from the Wabanaki people or people of the Dawnland, um, Wendat and Canadian Métis. I'm a registered member of the Abenaki tribe. I've been with Susco, geez, it's probably almost as long as Bruce. It's almost 20 years now. Um, time has gone by very quickly. I've been on the board probably 12 of those years. Um, I was born in the Northeast and um, I had a real connection with nature and um, spent some weekends hunting with my father and which was mainly an, an excuse to uh, walk in the woods to enjoy nature. And um, we never really shot anything, but it was just time to spend being with my ancestors there. I spent summers in Maine fishing and walking in the woods um, at our family cabin. Um, and then about 28 years ago, I moved to the city and um, I am not a city person at all. And I really yearn to be back in nature and to connect with the country. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a, a great time because I met a friend and then that friend introduced me to Charlie and Suskol. And um, now um, we can be at Suskol and, and um, as a urban native, and um, I'm very grateful to be with and serve Suskol. It has enriched my life and um, I feel very fulfilled. And that, that part of, that part of my, myself that was lost um, in the city, um, I can reconnect with that, um, that part. Um, I think having Susco House will help uh, urban, urban um, and rural natives and like-minded people to get together to share family stories, um, arts, crafts, and their medicines, and um, just to be safe and comfortable and have a sense of stability and to practice ceremony. So I, it's, it's a, it'll be a very valuable um, place for gathering and, and to celebrate. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cheryl King McMahon and I am uh, the treasurer on the board, uh, Susco board. And um, my uh, tribal affiliation is that I'm descended from uh, Powhatan people and the Cherokee people. Um, I've been involved with Susco for, well, as, as my, my other half said, about 20 years. As a child, I grew up in Nevada and uh, primarily in Nevada. And um, I lived in Reno, which was very close to the reservation there. And uh, there were lots of native kids in school with us. And I felt such a sense of um, connection with them, and I, which I did not understand at the time at all. Um, and then I, uh, when I grew up and I moved to Los Angeles, then I began uh, meeting some um, elders, taking some uh, classes, workshops with elders, going to powwows. And then moving to Northern California uh, uh, when my husband and I married and we were looking for a place to connect. And that's when um, he met a friend, as he said, he met a friend and that friend introduced us to Charlie. And we went up to the property and began doing ceremony. And um, it has really been an enriching experience being part of this not just doing the ceremony, but also um, helping to build Susco has just been um, the adventure really of a lifetime It's being wonderful. And when Susco House is completed, uh, I feel that it will be a gathering place, um, a safe place uh, 
for um, Native peoples from all over, uh, not just California, but all over, to um, learn about the traditions and ways of their ancestors in ceremony and uh, lots of classes, drum making and so on. Um, and a place to gather and share, tell stories and uh, help one another uh, and be in service to one another. So thank you very much. All right, hi. My name is Ree Cassell, and I am um, the secretary of the board. I am Ojibwe, um, but like a lot of people, I learned um, my affiliation through uh, some family members who just kind of dug in and tried to figure out where we came from. So I am one of those who, um, there were no records. We've traced us all the way back to a couple tribes, but um, a particular tribe, but because of back then you didn't announce that you were married to an Indian um, there or Native American, there were no um, records. So that's an interesting aspect. I've been with Susco for about 20 years. I met Charlie when I came back into the Valley. I really wanted to connect with my Native American side um, and delve more into that. And um, Susco provided that option for me. And it's been amazing. Um, I was very, very blessed to have a Native American blessing ceremony for my wedding and a blanket ceremony. And I brought all those traditions in that are important to me um, to start my life as a married couple. And it just expanded from there. So as we started with the Susco House property, I just kept feeling like, oh my gosh, we have more and more um, things that, that are, are, it's like a big puzzle piece and pieces are just being put together. And it's like, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And, and the Susco house is that last piece that um, makes that beautiful puzzle that you can hang on your wall and be very proud of. And I think that um, completing it will give an avenue of um, learning for my grandchildren who don't have a lot of history of um, where they came from. And it would be a great learning place for them. So I think it'll help the children. And thank you so much for being part of this amazing first virtual art auction for us. 2020 has been really crazy, but um, we're excited to be part of this virtual platform. And we really appreciate all the work that everyone, the board, Charlie, everyone in the office, May and Sal have put into this. And I really am honored to be part of it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Randy Foisey. Uh, I'm serving on the board of directors for the Sosco Intertribal Council as a board member at large. My tribal affiliation is through my grandmother. She was Blackfeet. Uh, she was adopted from an orphanage by my European side of my family. Um, and as a child, I can remember uh, sitting on her lap and and uh, as she told us native stories. So uh, that's my connection that way. Um, I met Charlie in the mid nineties, um, it's about 23 years ago. So I've known Charlie for quite a while. Didn't realize we were that old Charlie, but um, uh, I've gone to many of the powwows uh, hosted by the Sosco Intertribal Council. I began framing artwork for the art auction. And in 2020, I was asked to serve on this board and I accepted. Uh, I have learned a lot and I still have a lot to learn. So um, what I have learned is about the Soskal House. The Soskal House is an important project um, to hold and pass on the traditions of the native people. 
to make a connection with the earth and with the youth uh, and to mentor our young to keep us all on the right path. Uh, thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed getting to know all of us at the Susco Board. We are definitely enjoying every moment of what we're doing here to preserve the Native American culture. And speaking of preserving, the reason that we're doing this art auction is to support the Susco House. Charlie, what exactly is the Susco House? Well, I'm glad you asked, Marie. <laughs> and people used to ask me, because I'm so embedded, we have collectively been embedded for almost 30 years in creating this project, that you forget what people don't know. So Sunskull House, with the K, is the actual land project. And the land project is where we created a sacred place, a safe place for Native American people and other people who support Native Americans. Mm -hmm. um, to come and be in ceremony. Most of the impact of Susquehal House, it's a collective dream, but it's mostly a projected dream to help other people replicate it or be excited about it. So we have many, many supporters, like Ree said, around the world, but the people who actually come to the land, that's actually a smaller group of people that live in the area. And so now, again, with this new reality, we can continue to share what's done there, what we do to inspire people to know that there is and there are places on this earth dedicated to ceremony and prayer, to keep us calm, to help us as a two-legged evolve to our highest and most complete place. So in the slideshow, I, people have been asking me for more than 10 years to how did we do what we did? put it together, and I would put it together in writing, but when you make a list, even when you put it in bullet points, it's boring. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to make something that's not boring. So again, with the pandemic and having more time to contemplate the future and the present, I collected with the help of our office staff who came and helped collect all the pictures that we could find, which was a lot, over the last 20 years, and put it together in a slideshow that we're gonna present right now. The school and uh, they were taught to be to be a red hawk song, red tail hawk song.
And that's talking about he's coming. He's coming. And then when you hit the pause one, he's here and he's going around making his blessings. So that's why it has the stops in it. Wow, that was amazing. And that was so much work to put that beautiful slideshow together. I can't believe that I was here at the very beginning of that and gone through so much of that after 20 years. It, it feels like it just happened yesterday. So, wow. Tell us a little bit about um, the arbor. I love the arbor up at the um, property. It's just one of the most beautiful things that is up there and surrounded by the cedar trees. So tell us a little bit so what that When helped. we were first looking at property, I don't remember when Christmas we, the board got together, and I think you were still an auxiliary member of the board, but we were, drove around to, I think there were three sites that were available in the market. And that was the last place we went to. We weren't sure if we were at the right address because it was just raw land. There was no numbers or anything at that lot. Um, but then afterwards, when we, we put, you know, we, that was the place we ended up bidding on and getting. And then when we were dreaming how we're going to do things, how it's going to be designed, I said, well, the first thing we have to place on the land is the arbor because that's the center of everything. And Adam, you remember Adam? I remember Adam. You guys Adam. did a lot of road trips together. He used to go to the powwows. I had a stuff. crush on him for a while. He was like 16, so he was still But um, <laughs> he was still nice. He was. He was really sweet. I felt like he was my adopted son, and he used mm -hmm. to call me mom and stuff. But when I was saying that, we were out there on the site, and he said, I said, we have to decide with Arbor. Well, I know where the Arbor's going to be. And I said, where? He goes, well, remember I told you when we had looked at this lens, the three land uh, sites that same day on a Saturday, he had a dream of a golden eagle circling mm -hmm. around the property. He said, I knew this is the one we were going to get because that night I dreamt of a golden eagle and it dropped a feather here. And then he said, well, where the Arbor's going to be is where the feather dropped. And I said, oh. You remember where the feather dropped? He goes, yeah. I said, show me. So we walked mm -hmm. to the place, and then I said, well, let's mark it. So we put a little pile of rocks. He knew exactly where the feather dropped, and that is the fire center, which is the heart. Because what we say all the time, what Jim Baber, our elder, told us and used to repeat often, was what we need to pray, the sky is the roof, the earth is the floor, and the fire is the heart of our oh. ceremonies. And without these things, we cannot pray. So that where the golden eagle feather dropped is where the fire circle is for the arbor. And then, of course, the arbor was a collective dream, how every tree was grown from seed. We had a cedar tree that used to be by my house, and we collected the little seedlings, and, and they were all placed. Most trees were placed, dug and planted by two or three people. And then those people were kind of, if they stayed around, some people were just visiting the property to help out. But so a lot of the people stayed around for, you know, 5 to 10 to 20 to 30 years. Um, that was their responsibility to water the trees and make sure they survived through the hot summers. And so some of those trees now are almost 20 feet tall, and that's fun to see. Yeah, they're beautiful. And then as we progressed building on the um, property, we did a few little earth lodges and sun lodges. Tell us that a little a bit about that. That was a big job. Well, the very first thing was the architect, Judy Irvin. She's the one who came up with the land use plan. She met with us collectively. We were dreaming. And some of those pictures where we just looked like we're randomly sitting in a field, we were actually having discussions about where things would go, how it would go. And so she actually placed that. She was an urban planner and architect. She placed, uh, you know, on a survey map where all those things would be placed in the harbor. And we had the thought that little houses would be around. So the camping lodges were places that we thought we were initially were planning to do a straw bale house. We thought those would be camping lodges, that the three lodges that people stayed in as they were building the main house. Initially we had hoped or dreamed that it was going to be volunteers, but after having volunteers on the Earth Lodge, we realized that was a lot of work, and people kept telling us it's better to have professionals building a big building, and especially with a permitted building. And so the first Earth Lodge, we used to call them huts, but then um, one of the people that was involved, Guatemoc Landeros, involved in designing and teaching people how to build the lodges, he said, these are people. Because for us, as traditional people, when you are in ceremony and you do the blessing and you dream the place and you lay tobacco down and you have fires, they become living beings. So the lodges, so the first lodge was Earth Lodge. That was built by volunteers over two summers. Mm -hmm. And then we had the second summer, we had the architect Bob Tice come in 
And that was a work of love. You see that in the pictures, all those young people coming to put the finishing touches. The Earth Lodge is the Brown Lodge, faces the east, the sunrise. It's the new beginning. The second lodge is the Star Lodge. That's the light green lodge with blue bottles in it for the star. And that's a lodge that the one at Do you remember her? Mm -hmm. She's I a do. homo person. She's the one who taught me how to do. And so she's in some of these pictures in the slideshow. But her and I used to stand there kind of viewing the land, thinking this was before the arbor's built, thinking of how it was going to look. And then after the arbor, she said, this is where you and I will sit. And we'll be looking over things. And I said, why would we be sitting up here? Because it was just the side of the hill. Well, there'll be a little house behind us. And I remember once I was standing at the Star Lodge looking over and I thought, why do I feel like I've been standing here for so long? And I remembered hearing her voice uh, saying, because you and I will be sitting in front of this little lodge. So that's the Star Lodge and that's where it was dreamed and where it was created. Then we have the open field and then the Sunrise Lodge. Mm -hmm. We named all these lodges, a lot of them before they were built, but the Sunrise Lodge where its place is close to the outdoor kitchen and it holds our tools and it eventually will be a camping lodge too, but right now it's our storage shed and it's red. So it's the first place it turns out where the sun, when it's coming over the Eastern Hill, the first place the sun touches the property is right on that sunrise lodge and that's just above that wooden door so those are the three lodges it was a two-year project we got funded from a federal grant which was a big old deal to get a SEDS grant and uh, we trained California Pomos and a few other native men and women to how to build and straw bale and earth plaster and so those have been out there for 10 years they are really amazing amazing lodges but the main lodge the big one, the massive one, which isn't really that massive, is the, we finally got the foundation poured for the main house this it's last year. Suskel House, and that's Suskel House. Mm -hmm. And so we had had it planned, the foundation for it was cut when we built the arbor. Mm -hmm. So it had, it had tested, you know, for 10 years. Again, the architect had told us, you know, cut the house pad, so we can see how it weathers. It was a stable place on the site because there's a couple hills that so you want stable level. So it was very stable. And then we finally got the permits. We get, we went through earthquakes and now fires. So we've had a lot of major disasters that have kind of delayed the actual starting. But putting the foundation in, we're ready to put the walls and the roof. So the main thrust of this auction, this virtual auction, and why we want it to be such a widespread donors it's mostly has been supported by individual people like you giving small amounts of money. People always say, oh, when I win the lottery, I'll give you money. I said, well, you may never win the lottery, so why don't you give us 25 or $50 today? And that money has added up. Yes, it has. And we've kept saving it from the collective art auctions and uh, unrestricted funds we get from once we meet deliverables from a lot of our contracts and grants that we've got. Um, so we're ready to go. We are more than ready to go. I would love to get those walls up and the roof on. Well, we really yeah, hope we're to have there. We almost <laughs> have the walls and roof on now because we do have the money for that. Um, but all these fires we've had this summer. Yeah. So the fires are, you know, part of our rebalancing on the earth, and um, hopefully we'll get something done this fall. Yeah, I agree. So the next um, little clip that we have to share is our future generation. So you saw that little baby in the slideshow we just saw. She was the wedding ceremony at the arbor. Little baby with a little tuft of eagle feather in her hair. That baby is now 10 years old and she's offering a blessing song. So the other thing too is when you can do that generational healing, you do as much as you can during your lifetime. And then I was, it was shared with me that then our children carry that blessing, that burden yeah. forward. So as a family, we try to do as much healing as we can for our family unit and then also for the community at large. We really try to hold space for healing. So um, with that, this is Love Lenol. She's my daughter and she's been, um, we have tried our best to raise her as traditional as possible. You know, you, you, it's like you walk in two worlds the way it is now. Um, you know, it's, the world is different. And, but she wants to share a song. It's called Sky World by Bear Fox. And um, she really loves the song. So we're going to um, listen to her. It's also a great song just to honor the people who have been. 
Let's put our minds together as one and remember the ones who passed on to the sky world. Their life to these are complete. They're living peacefully in the sky world. In the sky world. I Let's put our minds together as one and remember the ones who passed on to the sky world. Their life to these are complete. They are living peacefully in the sky world. In the sky world. Let's put our minds together as one and remember the ones who passed on to the sky world. Their life to these are complete. They are living peacefully in the sky world. In the sky world. Let's put our minds together as one and remember the ones who passed on to the sky world. Their life to these are complete. They are living in the sky world. In the sky world. So this is uh, my favorite part of this virtual um, kickoff. Uh, for years, Charlie and I have done the um, art auction at the Yonville Community Hall. And we've always had fun bantering back and forth and, hey, we have this on sale and no one's bid on this. And I'm going to miss that part. But this is also an amazing um, time to and different. So what we're going to do is show you a few uh, pieces that we have in the auction. What we're going to do is describe a few pieces for you, get you jazzed up so that you go to the website. I'll tell you more about the website in a few moments. But the first one that we have to start with is this beautiful sweet grass basket. And one of the things that I love about the sweet grass baskets is they smell so good. So Charlie, tell me a little bit about Sweetgrass and why well, it's so is, special. This is, but the artist is Paul St. John. He's a Mohawk on the East Coast. And uh, one of our board members, this is his tribal member. This is an incredible, unique piece that you hardly see except at our art auctions on the West Coast. But he's turned into quite the artist in the 10 years we've been uh, sharing his work. A quill, this is a really ancient uh, method of art. It's dyed quills, making a little cardinal onto bark, onto birch bark. And then he does a quill frame. It's a porcupine quill around it. Sweet grass woven bark bottom. It's really amazing. Mm -hmm. And like Ray said, the smell is very calming, very healing, and it's medicine. It's medicine for tribes all through North America. So you've got a beautiful piece of art, functional art, 
woven together in a traditional manner. Uh, everything in this basket is authentic. Mm -hmm. Traditional, it's quill, bark, and sweetgrass. And about how long does it take someone to weave a small basket like mm -hmm. this? Because uh, Paul St. John is so, is so expert. He could probably do, from the time that you're, if you're growing the sweetgrass, harvesting the sweet grass, letting it get to the right place, that would be probably a few months. But the actual weaving, when you have all the materials gathered, you've got the quills, you've dyed the quills, you've got your materials ready, punching a hole for every little piece of thread. This, I would say this would take a few days. Uh, yeah. It's so carefully done. It might take a few weeks, but the prepping is quite it's a few months. months. Yeah, I love the baskets. It's the one thing that um, I'm always bidding on because they're, they're so lovingly done and so amazing, the work. And the bidding website is up now, so you can go see the art pieces. Bidding has started yesterday. And another piece we have is this beautiful, it's a limited edition sign print from Johnny Clay. He's from the Round Valley Pomo. He's a tribal member of the Round Valley Pomo Reservation, living in the Central Valley. He was our featured artist about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. But he created a lot of pencil art. This is some of his earlier work. It's a traditional California pomo dancer with the flicker feathers. These are usually orange. The little black tip of the feather is cut off, so just the stem of the feather makes the face gear. And the reason the California face is covered when they dance, they're praying for all people, and they're anonymous when they come before the Creator. Uh, the little antlers represent the deer antlers. He's got a uh, regalia. And this little symbol here is the four directions after the Christianization. Sometimes that's seen as a cross. But you can see the whole painting, the way he's done the whole frame of the painting, is with that flicker feather. And that's one of the more sacred prayer bear birds for the Pomo people. So this is a limited signed edition from Johnny Clay. It's so beautiful. We're, you know, Absolutely. We're really beautiful. happy to be able to share that. I think some of these, um, I know all of these, are so unique. If you have somebody for that you're trying to buy for for Christmas, these are amazing pieces, and everyone would love to open these for the holidays. So tell us about this piece of so, abalone necklace. Okay, so this is... Mike can hold it. So this is uh, Sal... Garcia Panola, he's one of our staff here at Sasco. He's from the Point Arena Band of Pomo on the coast, Manchester, Point, Point Manchester, Point Arena Band. So he started making these necklaces in a traditional format. Initially, he was making larger necklace pieces. He still does that. But then he started to want to go more and more traditional. So this is a traditional design with the little clamshell beads cut, the frame out accenting the circular abalone. The abalone is cut, he cut the abalone. Again, these pieces, they can sometimes people say, that's expensive, but the amount of labor, again, harvesting the abalone, cutting the abalone, getting these clamshells. He didn't cut the clamshells, these come uh, mass produced now. But he had the design with the sinew, but every hole that you cut in the shell, it has the opportunity to crack the shell. So after you've harvested it, you've cut it, you've polished it, and then you're making those little holes, each hole. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten holes that you might lose these beautiful discs. Abalone is getting more and more rare, so these necklaces are just going to increase in value. And again, the California tribes are some of the tribes, tribal people in California are 0.2% of the population. So there's very few people producing things like this. It's common when you go into the Pomo world, but most of you aren't there. So this is your opportunity to have a, you know, really a, a treasured museum quality piece. But we think of these again as living people. So this necklace was prepared in ceremony, he would have blessed himself, been really present in cutting the pieces and putting the necklace together. So this is just like the baskets, uh, we think of these as living uh, family members. They become relatives and are treated with that respect. They're very authentic. This piece has an incredible... Oh my gosh, it looks like a heart. Yeah, it's just a really unique wow. uh, piece of the abalone. Because again, and then it's really thick, so you know it's an older abalone. And it's just, it's just amazing. The colors are just amazing. So this is what you can be bidding on right now. So the... Art auction is online. We are going virtual and it's really, really easy to do. What you're going to do is you're going to go to sesquicouncil.org 
It's on the front page, so you don't have to search for it. And you're going to be able to look at the items. There's details on pictures. A couple of them even have videos. And they'll really describe what the items are, um, from the baskets to the necklaces to the prints. Also, when you go on, it's going to ask you to log in and create an account, and it's going to ask you for your credit card. But don't panic. The credit card does not get charged until the end if you purchase something. There's another button on the list, and it says Give to Susco House. For some reason, if you don't find anything that you like, which I can't imagine that happening, and Maybe you get outbid because people love the piece so much. You can go ahead and make a donation directly to the Susco House. And the donations are tax deductible. Thank you. She does the um, legal side there. <laughs> um, I've done a couple of these auctions. We are not the first one to do it. Um, there has been a couple other uh, organizations that have done it. And it is really, really fun. You're going to get, when you bid on something, it'll say, you're the highest bidder. And then if somebody else comes along and bids on it, it will notify you that you've been outbid. So you can jump back on and bid again. So the auction started yesterday, November 11th, and it'll go for 11 days until November 21st. So you have plenty of time to bid, outbid, upbid, and have fun with it. And share it. Tell your friends, tell your family. Every, you know, it's an, a great opportunity to look at some unique pieces you will, won't see in the marketplace anywhere. Yes, you will not see them. And with every piece, you are helping support our future generations with the Susco House. And you're creating a market for traditional art. Susco, when we started 30 years ago, there really wasn't a market. People didn't understand how precious these pieces were. They would think they were too expensive. Whereas now people say, where did you get that? And they realize the value. So by purchasing any of the art, especially these abalone pieces of the prints, you're supporting a future art market mm -hmm. for native people of California. There is just so much you're doing when you're contributing to our organization. So, so get on the website. This? It's live right now. Start bidding. Engage yourself. Go check it out every once in a while. See how it's going. It's going to be 11 days or it's going to be 10 days now. <laughs> and we hope you go to the site. And we're going to move on to a real nice clip of um, one of our powwows so that you can enjoy that before we end. Right. This is a powwow quite a while ago. This this powwow, this video is on YouTube, but it's got the most hits of any of our videos. It's the most popular. It really captures the love and the beauty of so many people. Mm -hmm. They were all younger. Those people are still with us. Most Almost everybody dancing in this video. And uh, it's just very upbeat. We want you to, you know, share the beauty. This is, I think this was going to be, this year would have been our 30th. 27th annual 27th oh, wow. annual and I think this one is the 20th annual or something but so 27 years we've been gathering in public setting the whole public is welcome and we're going to share a piece of that uh, beauty and love and joy with you on, in this next little clip enjoy People, many tribes, many nations. Yes, indeed. At one time, over 500 nations pre Columbus still here, representing from California to Maine, from Mexico to Canada, the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. The Cristobal Cologne mistakenly called Indians. That was his word. But these people out here, these indigenous people, and all their tribes represented don't have a word for Indian in their tribal languages. Be they Anasati, which is the host tribe here. Be they Pomo, Miwuk, Maidu. That's Columbus's word. They're the indigenous people, the Panasi people. Never told Christopher Columbus for Indians. They're beautiful, red people, indigenous to the Western Hemisphere. 
and you look around and you see people represented from coast to coast, north to south, from all four directions. And they vary in size and shape and color. All beautiful. The indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere here at Susquehanna Intertribal. It is indeed an intertribal dance, and this is our victory song.